Amen. I'm glad y'all came out to Bible study tonight. You got your Bibles, open it up to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2, or just look up here on the screen. Log on to the web, and because I'm going to move fast. I got a bunch of scriptures. This is Bible study, right? Yeah. All right. Watch this. Um, the... <laughs> We talked about, well, people, we had the altars were filled with people believing God for a miracle. Let me say again, how many of y'all need a miracle? Now, a miracle, a miracle is a, is a supernatural uh, intervention of God that bypasses, you know, natural reasoning. But a miracle, it, you know, God wants us to live by his wisdom, but, but until, you know, it takes time sometimes. You, God wants you to live in divine health. Isn't that right? He wants you to live in divine health. But if, you, if the doctor says you've got a week to live, you need a miracle. Because, you know, walking by faith, and it may take some time to do that, and you may just need a miracle. And maybe even in finances, you maybe you've gotten into such debt that everything looks really, really, really bad. And, and you know, there's, of course, prudence and wisdom and, and the wisdom of God and all that sort of thing. But you might not have time for that right now. You may need a miracle, and God's willing to do that. And I want to show you that in the scriptures. Are you all ready? You don't live off of miracles, but uh, you, need, you, you may need one. And everybody at one point in their life will need one. All right. Are you in Galatians chapter 3, verse 2? If not, just look up at the screen. All right. Look what Paul says here in Galatians. He says this. In fact, let me explain the book of Galatians. book of Galatians is written to the church at Galatia, and Paul is his, Paul's closest you can get to Christian cussing. He's really rebuking the church at Galatia because they have uh, gone into what theologians call Galatianism. What is, that's mixing of the two covenants, mixing of the old covenant and the new covenant. So he uses this harshest, strange, strongest language that you'll see Paul use in any epistle, right? And, uh, and, and so he's rebuking them very strongly. And there's a reason why, and that's what I want you to see. But he, he mentions something here in chapter 3 that we need to know. Watch this. He says, this only I want to learn from you. If you sat down with your kids, just tell me one thing. This the only thing I want to know is what made you do that. That's how he's talking. That's the tone in which he's talking. He says, this only I want, I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you? Come on down, baby. You all right? He says, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the, the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You get it? What's, what's the answer? You don't receive the Holy Spirit by working the works of the law. Isn't that right? You receive the answer is by the hearing of faith. And when he's saying faith, the context here is righteousness by faith. You receive the spirit by, by, by righteousness of faith. All right. That's what the whole gospel is. We jump down to verse five. Watch this. Therefore, therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you. Ah. So the same way you got the Holy Spirit is the same way you get miracles among you. Watch this. Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Same answer. By the hearing of faith. Watch this next verse. Verse 6. Just as Abraham believed God. All right. So he's saying the same way you receive the Holy Spirit is the same way you receive a miracle. It's the same way Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So you see the context is righteousness by faith. Y'all see that? Righteousness by faith is the way you receive everything from God. All right. Now watch this. Jump on over in your Bible. Let's take a look a little bit closer at, uh, at the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit. Look over at Luke chapter 11 and verse 11 through 13 we're going to peek at. All right. Because I got so many scriptures, just jot it down or just log on. Ready? Here it is. Luke chapter 11. Jesus talking here. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, if a son ask for bread. Look, listen to how practical, practical this is. If a son ask, uh, ask for bread from any father among you, will you give him a stone? Now think about this. Just think about it. Your son, y'all got kids. Who's got kids? All right. Your kids ask you, you love your kids. Hey, daddy, can I have some bread? Mommy, can I have some bread? And you, you, you go in and you like, yeah, yeah. Bam. <laughs> it's a rock. Like, is this a joke? Are you being silly? Or what, what a, no, no, you wouldn't do that, right? Read on. Watch this. Will you get, uh, or if he asks a fish, will you give him a serpent instead of a fish? Next. Or if he asks an egg, come on, it's breakfast time. You want some eggs? And he says, and some fish, right? And some bread, toast. Will you offer him a scorpion? What he's saying is, if he asks for something good, are you going to give him something that's destructive and bad? Or if he asks an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? Next. If you then, being natural, is what he's saying, being evil, natural, right? 
Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more? Always notice this throughout the, throughout the New Testament. Whenever you, and it's not only in the New Testament, it's in the Old Testament as well. We'll circle much more there. All the time when you see grace described, you'll always see the writer, be it G, the, the speaker, be it Jesus, be it Paul, because it's all, it's, all, it's all inspired by the same Holy Spirit, always describes grace as much more. If you do it one way, grace is always much more. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who do what? Work the works of the law? Yes. Simply ask him. So he's, saying, he's setting precedent here. He said, here's how you get the Holy Spirit. You ask for it. How do you get a miracle? You ask for it. All right. Now watch. So everybody's sitting there like, and? Now, here's the whole problem with that. That's why we're sitting there looking like, what else, pastor? Say something else. That's it. Here's the problem. We don't believe that. Now, let me show you why we don't believe it. Turn over and over in your Bible, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. First mention, law of first mention. Whenever someone, a topic, a subject is first mentioned in the Bible, there is significant revelation, right? First mention of the devil, first words from Satan, all right, are right here in Genesis chapter 3. Watch this. You know, this is the fall of man, chapter 3. Genesis, watch this. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, the serpent, said to the woman, has God indeed said? All right, already. We already see the law of first mention here. What is the devil's, the way he always operates is he's going to do what? Question God's word. That first. He's going to get you to question what God says. Has God indeed said? He comes to question what God, he wants you to question what God said. The ignorant Christian has no earthly idea what God said, right? Watch this. And Eve, what, has God said, and then he says this, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Has God said, Eve, he walks up to Eve, notice he comes to Eve and not Adam, comes up to her wife through the back door, so to speak, and says, hey, uh, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? All right? That's what he asked. Now jump over and let's see what actually God did say. Notice, and we're going to come back and look at this again. All right? J chapter 2, Genesis 2 and verse 16 and 17. Here's what God did say. Watch this. And the Lord God commanded the man, commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. And don't leave out freely. Circle freely right there. What God actually said was, of every, I command you of every tree of the garden, you can freely eat. Look at the next part. So the first thing God says to the, to the man is he commands him that you can eat of everything. Let me, let me, let me put this in perspective. Oh, let's read the next verse. Yeah, but of the tree, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Go back over to Genesis 3 and, and whatever verse that was, 1 or 2. Here it is. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Is that what God said? God said exactly the opposite. You shall eat of every tree. You shall freely eat from every tree of the garden. Here, let me give you a perspective of what that's like. Ladies, you like shopping? If, what's your favorite mall, baby? What's favorite mall, Millennium Mall, Orlando, Houston. Yeah, Which one? That one. Houston. Millennium Mall in Orlando. They got, a, they got okay, the store, the, the malls that have Louis Vuitton, red bottom shoes, y'all like those, right? They've got a, what other, the, that purse is. South Park. Okay, South Park. Okay, okay. They've got uh, all that stuff that you girls like. If, if God says, listen, of every store in this mall, you can have every, take anything. It's all yours to freely take but of that Kmart store don't touch that that's mine do y'all have a problem with that no. who has a problem with that okay men God comes up and says look at here we're at uh, we're at the um, what's that that where they got the Porsche that like? foreign car Italia God comes up and says look at here everything in here but this one BMW, I got that. Do y'all have a problem with that? God says, okay, of all these, I come in, y'all come in, of all these chairs in this building, y'all can sit everywhere you want to, but don't sit in my chair right there. And y'all standing all up in line at my chair looking like, pastor ain't right. Why he say we can't sit in this? Here? And that's what happened. So God's heart truly is freely eat 
everything, but one is set aside so you remember that I'm the one that gave this to you. Out of respect for me giving you all the, bent, the, all the cars at Auto Italia, don't touch this one, it's mine. That's God's true heart. But here's the problem. All, most of mankind has bought the lie that the devil has sold. God's holding out on you. God doesn't want you to have everything. In fact, did he say you can't eat of every tree of the garden? Do you hear what he's saying? You can't eat of every tree of the garden. Wow. Read it. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. It's, it's exactly the opposite of what God said. God said you can eat freely of every tree of the garden. Just this one, don't eat. That's mine. Just one. Just one. Is that a problem? No. no. Now, here's the problem. Most people think God's holding out on them. Now, let me, let me build my case a little bit better here. All right. Turn over in your Bible to, uh, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Everybody knows this passage, all right? Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Jesus says in Matthew, we read Luke before, but here's Matthew. Jesus said, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For most people who ask, for everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open. We don't believe that. No, no. We think Jesus is a big, fat liar. We do. No, no. Now, let me put it in perspective for you. How many of y'all have gotten on an airplane and you've gone up before you got in? You said, no, no, no. I got to talk. I got to see the credentials of, of the pilot. And you go knocking on that door before you go in. They're trying to sit down and get everybody seated. But you're like, no, 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 please. I got to. <laughs> can I see your license? Can I see you? Can I smell your breath? Let me see who, you know, and start checking them out. How many have done that? How many of you have gone right there in the seat, the door is closed, you sat in your seat, put your seatbelt on, and like me, put your iPod in your ear. They say, please turn off your electronic, all your electronics, and I pull one ear out, put my iPod in my pocket, and put my hand on this ear. <laughs> and my wife is like, Lee, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. I say, shh, I'm not under the law, I'll do what I want. I'm just playing, I'm just playing, I'm just playing, I'm just playing. Till one time, she came over and busted me, said, hey, do you have something on, sir? I was like, uh... <laughs> Huh? <laughs> right? Right. So, so, right? But y'all take for granted. You trust that that pilot who you don't know is going to fly all y'all wherever you want to go. Okay, ladies, how many of y'all ever went to the doctor and you get to the doctor? You sit in the lobby all day and then they say, you come in there, you check in and they say, okay, we need you to go downstairs and we need to take some blood from you. And you, you don't know, you have never seen these people before. And you don't ask no questions about how much blood. You just go, okay. And they, they sticking needles in you. You didn't see if they pulled them out of the plastic. You didn't ch ask them about their gloves. You didn't ask them if they, you know, did you change some gloves in the last time? Did you go to the bathroom? You don't ask any questions. You just be sitting there, okay. You too, No, I'm just making a point. I don't, it's just, let me preach. And you, <laughs> all right, you don't ask any questions. They take your blood and they say, okay, you're going to have to come back. Uh, we're going to have to run some tests on that blood. Stop by the counter on your way out. And you got to pay them for taking your blood. And then they make you come back in three weeks. You don't ask no questions. You go, okay, come on back. The God of heaven and earth who created everything says, ask and I'll give it to you. Seek and you'll find. You're like, well, I, 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 that simple. But no, 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 no. We would rather believe a doctor, a pilot, a lawyer, or somebody at the office, anybody rather than the God, rather than the God of heaven and earth who cannot lie, yeah. cannot fail. Yeah. For everyone who asks, receives, and who seeks, finds, and who knocks, it will be open next. Or what man is there among you if his son asks for bread? Do you see what God's saying? If you being human, being frailty, being imperfect, your kids ask you for something, you ain't going to give them something they don't ask for. Right. And he follows that. I mean, that's following, ask me. Yeah. All right? Okay, are y'all with me? So we, what do we do? We ask for a miracle. Y'all know the rest of the text. Now, turn on over, turn on over. Let's just look at Jesus for a second. Deuteronomy, not Jesus. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 10. 
All right. The children of Israel, God says to him a promise. He says, look at here. I'm, a deli- I'm delivering y'all out of, the, out of bondage and slavery. They're God's people, even though they're in bondage and slavery. Isn't that right? They're God's people, but they're in bondage and slavery. Why? Because they've forgotten the covenant, right? The covenant that they were under, the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've forgotten the covenant. They're in slavery. God sends a deliverer, Moses. God wants them delivered. And he sends, they're slaves now. And he sends a deliverer. And God tells them, listen, look what I'm going to do to you. So it shall be. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, which he swore. God doesn't have to swear. But he's trying to make a point, which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities, which you did not build. Houses full of some good things, of all good things, which you did not feel. Hewn out wells, which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, God's already anticipating. Listen here. When y'all get there and you've eaten and they're full, don't forget me. They didn't believe it. When they get to the promised land, the tip of the promised land, isn't that right? They get to the Barna Acadia, whatever that place is, and they're getting there. They send in, send in spies, right? 12, 12 spies for 40 days and 40 nights. They come back and say, yes, Moses, you was right. Place is, is, is the bomb. It's off the hook. Look at the grapes. Two dudes carrying one cluster of grapes, right? You ain't never seen grapes that big. Big as, big as Bobby's head. One grape. <laughs> right? Two dudes carrying it. Y'all know that that is the symbol in Israel. That is the, uh, the tourism, uh, what do you call it? Like uh, the emblem for tourism. It's meant uh, uh, of one man, two men carrying a, uh, a, what do you call that thing? A staff of grapes. That's their emblem for tourism. It's the promised land, right? God says, I'm giving you all this. They get over there. They say, okay, yes, it is flung with milk and honey. Only one problem. <laughs> there's giants up in the north. There's giants down in the south. There's giants of, there's uh, Amorites. There's ghettoites over here. There's your mama and themites over here. There's these uh, Hispanicites, these Mexicanites, these Negroites. There's the, uh, and they started naming all these problems, right? And God said, what does that have to do with anything? I said, I'm giving you the land. You looked at the giants and saw the problem and said, I don't believe it. And they didn't make it in. Why? It was too good to be true. They couldn't believe it. How are you going to? Here's the whole deal. God knew. No, if you just believe me and just go, I'll get rid of the giants for you. Y'all just believe me. We are the just shall live by faith. You have to believe God. If God promised you, and he did, God has promised that you're blessed. And you don't ask him, listen, if you really believed what God said, you would not stop talking to him. You would the whole day, Lord, you would talk constantly to him about what you want. You would talk constantly, because he said, ask, we didn't say, we didn't tell him to say that. He said that on his own. Is it hot or is it just me? It's just me. Okay, okay. Just checking, just checking, just checking. Dang. It's you. All right. Okay. All right. Now watch this. So they didn't get the promised land. Just two guys did who said, we can take this land. Giants are nothing. They're bread for us. Jump on over to 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 8 or just look up here on the screen. All right. This is all prelude. Y'all going to love this though. Watch this. Y'all remember King David. King David uh, had many wives right? He had several wives, several children. One day when the, his army, the, the Israeli army is battling the Philistines, he stays back home. He goes out on his roof and there's this fine, ow, oh, she's a brick, dun, dun, bum, mm. bum, bum, bum. ow, Did that. Bathsheba is over there bathing in the naked, right, naked. He's out there looking at it. He's like, oh, snap. He's like, I got to have her, right? He's got everything. Okay, y'all know the deal. And he sends out his, his, some of his servants. They go and get her, bring her in. He hooks it up with her, wink, wink, right? And, and uh, finds, finds out she's pregnant. One of her, her he uh, goes and, and retrieves her husband, Uriah, who's out in the army. He tries to bring him in, get him drunk, send him home with his wife and, and sleep with her. So to try to cover up his, his sin, right? But, but, the, but Uriah is so faithful, he sleeps on, on the doorsteps of the, of the, temp, of, of the uh, palace, right? Won't go anywhere. And so he's like, well, we're going to have to kill this dude. So David does a terrible thing. He's, he commits adultery and then has the dude murdered 
essentially, that Uriah murdered, right? Samuel, the prophet, comes over. We talked about Samuel. Samuel, the prophet, comes over, and he's telling him this parable. He says, listen, king, you will not believe this. There is this dude in, the, in the, your kingdom. He is poor. All he has is one little lamb. But then there's this rich dude who has everything, comes over and takes the dude's one little lamb. King is first. Who is he? Where is he? He goes, it's you. Ooh, snap, right? And, and, and so, uh, and look, listen what God says to him. He's feeling terrible about this, but watch what God says to him. Bad situation, right? Watch the grace of God. Look at verse 8. This is what God says to him. God says to David, I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your keeping. Remember Abigail, all that stuff? Abigail, Nabal's, Nabal, that old man who kind of re- was mean to King David and his army. And uh, Abigail, he, he had several wives, watch this, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if, it had been too, if that had been too little, I would have also given you much more. What he's saying is, David, if you would have just asked me, I'd have given you more. Why do, uh, uh, are y'all following me? Come on, this is David. Was David. David was in the wrong, but God is showing him, listen, all you got to do is ask me. I'll give you more. Come on, somebody. This is a God who said, eat of every tree freely of the garden. All right? Are y'all following me? Y'all want more because you're still not convinced. Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Are y'all certain that it's not hot in here? Okay. Okay. Anybody got a funeral fan with him? A funeral fan? You can just say, I'm saying, with Martin Luther the King on one side and a lamb, Jesus holding a lamb on it. I'm saying, we don't have any of those. All right, watch this. All right, this is the story of Jabez. It's just two lines, two verses. Watch. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. What Jabez's name means is son of my sorrow, of my pain. Can you imagine naming your child, hey, come here, pain in the neck. Come on. Come on. All your life. How would your, how would your child feel? He'd feel so beat down, his, his self-esteem and self-image would be, my own parents, my own mom, I'm, I'm a pain to my parents. Come on, can you imagine that pain? And watch what happens. And Jabez, look at Jabez. Jabez called on the God of Israel. Think about what he's having. He's been beat down his whole life. He's got a whole family of brothers that doesn't even talk about any of their names. It just says his mama said he's a pain to him. He's a pain. But he was more honorable. Why was he more honorable? Oh, it says here. Because he says... He called on the God of Israel. What prayer does is say, God, I cannot, but you can. You get it? When when you don't ask God, you're saying, no need, God. I got this. And Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil and that I may not cause pain. Listen to that. So God granted him what he requested. That's all you see about Jabez in the Bible right there. That's it. He simply asked, I ask you. All you all, so many people came up to the altar Sunday and said, I need a miracle. I ask you, have you asked him for it yet? Have you asked God? Listen, listen, listen. Have you asked him? My wife and I were sitting this morning drinking coffee and at the kitchen table, and we have these uh, big windows in our kitchen, and we had the windows open and there's, you know, there's rabbits and we're just kind of looking outside and looking out back and just sitting there going, wow, how, just being very grateful, you know, being very grateful. And we were, we started reminiscing back and we said, wow, you remember, remember, uh, I said, let me ask you something. Cause I started talking to her about these verses. I said, you know, God is going to do so much in our lives. And I said, Hey, let me ask you something. I said, Shanae, did you ask God for this life years ago? She goes, yeah right? Because she was kind of being the advocate to, when I was showing her what I was going to teach on tonight. She was like, she was saying, um, well, people are going to think I have asked God, but he didn't do it, right? I said, my answer to her was, did you ask God for the life that you now have? I said, I know you did because when we were dating, you told me. <laughs> we were dating and she said her and her girlfriends had went out to, they somehow rented a limousine or were going to somewhere, had a limousine had a function and a whole bunch of your girlfriends a few of them went to this beautiful restaurant clubhouse and Sinead in the car said this is the life I want 
I want to bless life. I want to bless life. And then, watch. And, and so I asked her, I said, look, do you have a blessed life now? She goes, yeah, I definitely do. I said, yeah, because while we're sitting here drinking coffee and eating grapefruit, do you remember when we used to be on this job in the bank in Columbus and we both hated it and we'd have to be there at eight o'clock and go through this rush hour traffic in Ohio and Columbus and you remember all that? I said, look now. I said, you asked for it and you got it. I said, however, I said, do you re remember when you had that first knucklehead boo-boo husband that you had? And he was pushing you around and jacking you up and, and abusing you and all this sort of stuff and got another woman pregnant and all this stuff. I said, did it look like it was going to happen then? Wow. No. I said, it probably didn't. But it did. God heard you. Yeah. I said, all right. He heard you and it came to pass. And I said, and it's not finished yet. Yeah. Same for you. Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Let's read on. I want to show you a couple more examples. Now watch. Here's Jesus. Jesus, we, we all want, need a miracle. Watch this. John chapter 2. Y'all know it. Uh, oh, John chapter 2. John chapter 2 is uh, Jesus turning water into wine. John chapter 2. Y'all got John chapter 2? Can y'all put that up there? You don't even have to put it up there. I just can tell about it. Y'all know what Jesus' first miracle was. All right, all the deep people won't like this, but here's Jesus' first miracle. Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine at a wedding feast. Now, there's all types of typology and picture in there. It's about a, about a bad, you know, it's saying that you can turn a bad, God can turn a bad marriage into good marriage. But, but, but the point is, this first miracle, again, the law of first mention, the first miracle that Jesus did was not, there was nobody's life on the line. There was nobody's baby dead. There was nobody blind. There was nobody sick. There wasn't anybody crippled. They ran out of wine at the party. Why did they run out of wine at the party? Did they pour it out down the drain? They drank it all. So all the preparations for the wedding party, all the libations were consumed quickly. All right? They drank it all up, and Jesus' mom and the disciples happened to be there. And Jesus' mom steps up and held up, no problem, y'all. <laughs> Excuse me, son. <laughs> Can you imagine this? Everybody's at the party. Hi. <laughs> y'all act like you haven't been to weddings. Even Brian. Come on, Brian. What was they doing? <laughs> I do weddings. I know. I, I usually don't go to the party. Shanae there, and I see the video afterwards. My son, Shanae, and all of them. <laughs> There's a video that we did at that last wedding that, my, that I need to send in to America's fa Funniest Videos. Trey is dancing so hard, he starts going. He turned into Michael Jackson. I'm like going, what is this? This is going crazy. All right. They run out of wine at the party. Jesus' mother comes over to Jesus and says, hey, they ran out of wine. <laughs> He's like, what's that got to do with me? <laughs> she walks away, okay. Whatever he tells y'all to do, do it. I know he's going to do something. <laughs> what does Jesus do? Go give him a little bit. No, he says, go fill up. These are 150 gallon, gallon concrete, whatever you call it, containers. Fill them up with water to the brim, right? Then, of course, they bring them all in, the, and, the, and the governor dips it in, and he says, good gracious. He's like, how y'all say the best wine to the end? Now, get what he's saying right here. Get what he's saying. What he's saying is, typically, even if you brought out some mad dog right now, <laughs> nobody would know the difference because everybody's already drank. Everybody's pretty... Tips. <laughs> I know that song y'all talking about. Everybody's pretty tipsy right now, and they would not even know the difference. But y'all brought the absolute best out now. This is Jesus' first miracle. Nobody's life on the line. The miracle is simply, get ready, religious people, to bump up the party. That's all it was. That's all the, that's all the miracle was. Okay, everybody all right? Any first-time guests here other than Pastor Davis? Pastor Davis, he knows me, so he'll be all right. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, first time. You all right? Baby, okay. Cool, cool. Okay. All right. All right. Y'all see that? That's the first miracle. Now, why is that? Why did, you, did Jesus have to make that the first miracle? He chose to make that the first miracle. Why? Because he's trying to show us, this is my person. This is what I do. I love you. Ask me, and I got you. 
All right, let's go a little bit deeper for Jesus because y'all still ain't convinced. All right, uh, John chapter 11 and verse... Six. Ooh, the John chapter 11. John chapter 11, is that right? Yeah, yeah, John chapter 6, verse 11. Thank you. Watch this. This is the only, the only miracle that's in four, all four Gospels. The only one miracle that's in all four Gospels is this. Jesus feeding the multitude of 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. Now, all the Gospels say that. But this account says something very unique. And I want you all to see this in this story. This is phenomenal. It helps you understand the personality of Jesus. John chapter 6, verse 11. You all remember the story, right? Let me just explain it to you because if you read it all in all four accounts, you really get some truths here. Andrew and I believe Philip, two guys, they had, uh, they had realized these people had been following Jesus and uh, everybody's getting hungry and it's getting to be dinner time. It's getting to be late. They come up and say, Jesus, look, <laughs> uh, we need to send all these people home. <laughs> uh, they're getting hungry, and, uh, you know, we can't be eating in front of people. We're kind of hungry, too, and it's not, it's, you know, it ain't be proper. If we sitting up here grubbing, and all these people are hungry. Jesus, and he says, we need to send them away. Jesus says, ah, you all feed them. He tells them, you all feed them. And, of course, then Philip and Andrew start coming up with the problem. They said, oh, one of them says, hey, uh, the crowd's too big, and uh, we don't have enough for them. Another guy, and the other guy says, look, we only got this much money, so much denarii, and even if we go to the store and get some bread, everybody's just going to get a little bit. <laughs> there is not enough for all these people. And, and, and then the Bible says that Jesus, it says, but Jesus knew what he was going to do. He already knew what he was going to do. He was just letting us see the mindset of humanity. The mindset of humanity is my problem's too big and my resources are too little. And the pro problem is they were looking at them and their ability. They didn't even take into account that this is the king of kings and the lord of lords who created everything, who's talking to them, who's sitting right there. She said, well, go get what y'all got. Well, we got this little dude who's got five loaves and two fish. Go get it from him and bring it to me. At the end, let's read it. Verse 11, and Jesus took the loaves, and when, he, and when he took the loaves, he took it and ate it all himself and said, sorry, y'all. <laughs> that would be jacked up, but he didn't do that. <laughs> he, he didn't scarf it down. He said, he took, Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down. And there's all kinds of truths in here. Y'all have heard me teach a whole series just on these passages. Watch this. And likewise, the fish, as much as God wanted them to eat. Oh, as much as they want it. Can y'all put verse 12 up there? The miracle didn't stop until every, the next verse. So when they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. How much did they end up with afterwards? 12 baskets full, right? So they start out with a little bit. Everybody gets as much. Come on, y'all know it. Come on, stop playing. You know if this was your family reunion and it's fried fish and biscuits with hot sauce and say, everybody, take as much as you want. You'd be the first in line, isn't that right? Jesus said, no, make them sit down because I knew T-Bone was going to be up here take it, trying to take all, 12 of these, all five of these loaves. Sit your tail down. I'm going to bring it to y'all. Listen to this. He has them delivered to them. Y'all sit down and rest. I got this. And it, imagine, probably they're probably just going, oh, dang, we're probably just going to get a little bit. Y'all see that little bit he got? <laughs> as much as they wanted. And everybody was full. And then they had 12 big baskets left over. And we're afraid. Now, watch. Let me just teach you something right here. That the only reason Christians think small the only reason you think small is you don't believe God yet. You don't know the God who you live with, the God who lives with you, the God who, who is your God. You don't know him yet because if you really knew how, much God, how big God is and how much he loves you, you'd stop thinking small. You'd stop limiting things to your own ability. You know you can't do it. That's most Christians' problems. They try to limit what God does based on what they've got and what they can do. Right. Wrong! He's God, not you. Y'all well, still ain't convinced. Let me give you another one. Jump on over to, uh, okay, Peter. Peter, that's in, uh, what is that, Luke 4 maybe? Luke 5? 
Okay, Luke 5. Peter. Y'all remember? I'll just tell you the story. Here's Peter, and uh, he's been out fishing all night and has caught nothing, the Bible says. He's been out all night fishing, caught zero fish, right? And so Jesus comes up in the morning, and he's going to teach, and he's looking for a boat to stand on because wherever he preaches, he draws a multitude of people. He walks up to Peter. Peter didn't realize it, but it was his good day. It was a good day when Jesus picked him and not all the other fishermen. I've been there and picked all the other fishermen. He picked him. He said, can I use your boat? He says, okay. Okay, cool. Go ahead and use my boat. He goes on and Jesus starts preaching the gospel from the seashore, right? Multitude around. And what is Peter doing the whole time? Peter's over there cleaning his nets. He's been out all night. Now, have y'all ever been in sales or working somewhere and you work real hard and no money? <laughs> Bad day for Peter, right? So then Jesus got into the boat. He preached and then he says, hey, Pete, uh, can I, he, Pete comes back on the boat. He's, look what he says. He says, thanks for using your boat. He says, uh, how's your fishing day? I'm just adding in this part. He's, this is probably what went on. He said, well, not too good. We didn't catch anything. No problem. Why don't you launch out, out into the deep? When he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Peter, launch out into the deep and let down your nets, your nets, circle nets, for a catch. Luke chapter 5, right? But Simon answered and said to him, look, 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 uh, master, <laughs> Teacher, uh, we've been working all night. We've toiled all night and caught nothing. Now, I understand you're a good preacher. <laughs> I see how good you are. You've got a good multitude there. I, however, am an avid angler. This is what I do for a living. You see that other boat over there? That's my boat. I've been doing this my whole life. Now, I don't mean to offend you or anything. So at your word, I'll do it. But just trust me, I've been out all night. There are no fish. Jesus says, launch out in the deep. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the yeah. net. Circle net. You see the difference? Peter is already assuming, I'm not going to catch anything. So I'm not going to put nets out. I'm going to put my one old ghetto net that, that you, know, is, you know, is whack anyway. But why am I? I just cleaned up my good nets. I'm not going to put on those nets. But Jesus won't know. <clears throat> right? And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. Next one. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. So Jesus had in mind, I'm going to give this dude so much fish. In fact, that was Peter's last day as a fisherman. He was like, oh, snap. Watch what you mean. When Peter, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. What came first, his repentance or God's blessing? It's the blessing of God that brings, goodness of God that brings repentance. He blesses him, and then it causes him to repent. Come on, somebody. God doesn't bless you because you're good. God blesses you because he's good. Are you with me? Peter leaves the fishing business that day and says, I get it. You're the, you're the key to my success. It doesn't matter what I do. Where you go. Now, think about, think about the scenario. Think about it realistically. Same boat. Same sea. Maybe same net right? Different results. Why? Same day. Why? Jesus was the only difference, and he's on the boat. Guess who's in your boat all the time? Is Jesus holding back from you? The devil will tell you that he is. Are y'all with me? All right. Watch this. Watch this. Let's move on. Let's go a little bit deeper because y'all still looking funny. All right. Now, hold on. Let me explain this. The gospel is that what I've just showed you the grace of God is God freely gives in super abundance and all you do is ask why we don't believe that is exactly why Paul wrote the book of Galatians look over at Galatians chapter 1 now again this is Paul's strongest language this is this is how he cusses at the uh, church at Galatia. Y'all went there. Now watch what I've just shared with you is what the world doesn't know. And sadly, the saddest indictment is most Christians don't know this. They don't know how good God is. They think you have to do something. I can't. Qual it doesn't. If you have it in your heart that that's what you need, you ask God for it, and then move towards it and say, God, show me. If it's mine, it's mine. You'll open the door. Yeah. If not. I know it's not mine or not my time yet, and it's all good. Yeah. Are y'all with me? Don't be afraid to ask him. He's got more than enough. In fact, I've shared this before, and some of y'all don't like this, but, but you know, when, when Sinead was pregnant and nursing, 
You know what it is? God is like that. In fact, God is called El Shaddai, which means, literally in the Hebrew, all-breasted one. And if you've ever, if you ladies have ever nursed a baby, uh, you'll know when that baby starts nursing. And that milk, if the ba- if you don't nurse the baby, the milk what? dries up. If you start nursing though, you can keep nursing until he's a teenager if he keeps on nursing. 40 years old if you keep on. I'd, praise the Lord. Okay, let's get off of that. Isn't that right? <laughs> Amen. But the more you take, the more there is. This is how God is. The more you take and the more you take from him, the more there is to take. It hurts. You notice Jesus rebuked with the disciples every time was, oh, you of little faith. It was never, oh, you keep asking me for so much. Stop asking me for too much. It's always, oh, you of little taking. That's what it means. Oh, you, is that all you're taking? We're the children of God. How does it impress the world and make them jealous for us being broke down, busted, disgusted, sick, tired, and then we say, you need to come and receive Jesus. They're like, Jesus looked like he's struggling with you. I mean, he must have some problems already. You broke down. And no, no, and this is what the devil wants. And let me show you, this is why Paul is fussing so bad. Why? Is because the, mess, the gospel, which is the grace, the unearned, unmerited favor and blessing and abundance of God is yours freely, was attacked immediately as after Paul preached it. Watch this. Look at this. Are y'all in Galatians chapter 1, verse 3? Grace to you and peace, unearned favor to you, and shalom, nothing missing, nothing lacking, from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next. Who gave himself for our sins. This is always the preclude to you receiving the grace of God. you got to know all of your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Every sin you've ever committed, ever will commit, has already been paid for at the cross. Are y'all with me? Yes. Amen. Let me see. Let me show you. Uh, look, just in case you don't know, Ephesians 1 and 7. Can y'all put that one up there? I didn't go over this in the first service. Ephesians 1 and 7. Can y'all do that for me? I may go through several of them up there. In him, this is Ephesians 1 and 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of part of our sins till we get born again. Of sins according to the riches of our confession. Okay, here's how you know how much forgiven you are. The riches of his grace. Read in the Amplified. The immeasurable riches of his grace. It's immeasurable. You are forgiven according to how much grace he has. Let me show you another one. How about uh, Colossians 2.13? Colossians 2.13. Bam. Y'all just pull up all them verses that I got there. I'm going through all of them. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Colossians 2.13. You ready for the next one? And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you most of your trespasses. That you've got to get a revelation of. You've got to know that. I've got enough series on that to know. See, oh, okay, let me, let me go on. And let me, let's, let's keep moving, and I'll show you why this is so important. Hebrews chapter 10, 16 and 17. Just write it down. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. Here's the new covenant. I will put my laws into their hearts and, write them, uh, and I will write them in their minds, right? And I will write them next. Then he adds their sins and their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. Your sins are gone completely. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Now, go back over, go back over to Galatians chapter uh, whatever, 1 and verse 5 now. Yeah. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Next. Watch what Paul says here. I marvel that you are, I'm astonished. I'm amazed. I am lambasted that you all are turning away so soon from him who called you in the unmerited favor of Christ to a different gospel. Stop. Back up, please. You have right there the definition of the gospel. What is it? The grace of Christ Christ equals the gospel. If you wrote it down in a formula, it would write gospel equals unmerited favor or gospel of Christ. That is the gospel. Amen. Let me show you another passage that says it. Look over at, um, look over at, uh, and jump to this one, Acts 20 and verse 24. 
They'll put it up here on the screen for you. Acts 20 and verse 24. Paul, speaking to the, um, called all the, the elders of Ephesus together. And he's telling them, y'all ain't going to see me no more. I'm taking my last missionary trip. This is going to be the last time y'all see me. He, and he explains some things that had went on. And he says, you know, all these things have happened in my life. Under all this tribulation, all this problem. He says, but none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So the gospel, again, Paul says, is the unearned favor of God. The gospel is no limit in his goodness to you. It's unearned, it's unearned grace. For by grace are you saved through believing. Through unearned favor. You didn't deserve this, but I'm giving it to you. All right, that's the gospel. Jump on over. Go back over to uh, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 or 7, I believe. Yes, I marvel. So Paul's fussing. He's going, I'm amazed that you're turning from him who called you into the unearned favor of Christ to a different gospel. Next. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel want to pervert the gospel of Christ he says there is truly no other gospel there really isn't another but there's some who are perverting this gospel and selling it as the gospel the gospel is the unmerited favor of Christ towards you jump on over in your Bible to Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 I don't know if I have that in my yes yes Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 if you can. Yes, Paul says, Romans chapter 1, the, in the Magna Carta of the gospel, Romans, Paul writes in the first chapter, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I used to always wonder, why would Paul be ashamed of the gospel? Until I started preaching grace and I understood. When you say all of your sins are forgiven, that God wants to give you everything he has, not required based on what you've done, but based on what he's done, religious people will go, that ain't right. No, no, because you got to do X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. This is it. Why? Because why? the gospel of Christ, it is the actual dunamis, that word power is dunamis, of God to salvation, soteria, to healing, to deliverance, to preservation, to abundance, deliverance from hurt, harm, or danger. Soteria is that word. Sozo is a short word for it. He says, for the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of Christ is literally the power of God to the healing, to the abundance. If the if the gospel is the power of God to all of his salvation, if you were the devil, what would you attack? The gospel. Are y'all following me? If you were the devil and the gospel is the dunamis, the power of God to healing, to abundance, you, all you got to do is contaminate that gospel and nobody gets the abundance. So you got a bunch of broke down Christians talking about, oh, I love the Lord. Ignorantly, sincerely, but ignorantly. And then when they hear the true gospel, that ain't right. The true gospel sounds so foreign because we've, and, and that's why I preach this over and over and over. Because if you're like me, grew up in the church like I grew up in, it's going to take you a long time to undo that jacked up thinking, this broke down thinking. Get rid of that stinking broke down thinking. Push the person next to you and say, stop thinking so small. Get rid of your small ambitions. You're a child of the Most High God. You're perfect in God's sight. And he said to you, a written contract, ask and I'll give it to you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Well, I don't believe that, Pastor Lee. Well, you just disqualified yourself. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Whatever you don't want, I'll take theirs, Lord. Yeah. I do believe it. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who achieves, believe. for everyone who does exactly right, believe. for everyone, for everyone who simply believes it. How many believers believing in here? Yeah. I know that sounds like a paradox, but most believers don't believe that. For the Jew first and also for the Greek, verse 17, watch it, for in it, for in that gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed. 
Apocalypto is that word, revelation. There's a revelation of the righteousness of God from faith to faith. Is a revelation of your righteousness? No. Let me tell you what the, what the gospel is not. The gospel is not a revelation of your righteousness. It is a revelation of his righteousness. It is not a revelation of your wrongdoings. Most churches you'll go to, you'll hear about how wrong you are, how, how messed up you are. You'll hear about your unrighteousness. You'll hear about your righteousness. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with his righteousness. Amen. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things will be added to you. The centerpiece and power of the gospel is the righteousness of God and the, the grace of Christ. That are the, and that's why Paul said in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17, if you'll just receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, you'll reign in life. If you'll achieve the abundance of grace, receive it. There, God has no problem giving. We have a problem receiving. Are y'all listening to me? Oh, come on, come on. Tell somebody next to you, say, we're about to walk in everything God has. No more plan. No more plan with this. No more plan. Seriously, 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 seriously. I'm not playing anymore. Stop playing with this. Let me make it deeper for you. Let me, let me push you in a little bit deeper. Y'all ready? Everything. Jump back over to Galatians. Jump back over to Galatians. Okay, settle down, settle down, settle down. <laughs> I'm just playing. No, no. Watch this. Uh, jump on over. Let's go over to Romans chapter 413. Romans 413. I skipped a bunch of them, but that's all right. Ooh, we only got 10 minutes. Watch this. Romans 10. Oh, no, no. What did I say? 413. Romans 413. Say, I'm the seed of Abraham. All right, watch this. Isn't that right? What Galatians says, through Galatians 3.29. You're the, if you, and if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the covenant. Isn't that Rome, Romans, uh, Galatians 3.29? Yeah. Heirs according to the promise, right? Isn't that right? Galatians 3.29. But watch this. What is the promise? Here it is. G Romans chapter 4.13. For the promise that Abraham, he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed. Say, that's us, that's us. That's us. Through the law, but through the... Abraham received the promise of an inheritance of the world through righteousness of faith, not keeping the works of the law. And it says, you are his seed. It's the same way you receive it. Amen. That's why you receive a miracle, Galatians 3 said. You receive it by the hearing of faith. Righteousness by faith. So, all right, now, y'all love types and shadows. Y'all want one? Y'all want a cool one? This was the bomb. Anybody in the first service today? Who is there today? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, back there. Good, good, good. Watch this. Turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. All right, a little history lesson here real quick. King, King David had a son who was his heir named King King Solomon. King Solomon was born to who? Who's, what was his mom's name? Bathsheba. Isn't that odd? The heir, he had all these sons, but the heir of the throne is the one born out of adultery and murder. Why? Showing you the grace of God. God can take even your mistakes. It doesn't matter how bad you've messed it up. Push the person next to you and say, it doesn't matter how bad you've blown it. Push him right there. Somebody push him. Push everybody. Push him. Push him. If you ain't close enough, push the person in front of you. Push them. How many of y'all make mistakes like me? You've blown it. You've blown it in marriage. You've blown it in money. You've jacked it up somehow. Say it's not over yet. <laughs> David blew it, right? But God's showing us it's all right. He's the heir to the throne. Your mistakes, I'm still going to make it your ministry and your blessing. Amen? All right. Solomon. Solomon. God says to Solomon, um, uh, uh, sells to David. David says, I want to build you a house. God says, David, you're, you're, there's too much blood in your hands. I'm going to, your son though. Sh Solomon means, uh, means uh, uh, peace. Peace. Solomon is peace. Sh Shlomo or something like that. It means peace. He's a, he, Solomon is a man of peace, right? So we all remember Solomon's problem though. Solomon had, uh, he, has, he had some girlfriend problems. <laughs> women problems. He had 700 wives and 300 por uh, concubines, <laughs> porcupines, Concub con concubines. That's just straight up. Oh, 700 wives 
And these were princes, 700 princes. Everywhere he'd go and do business, they'd send princes, you know, the king, he'd meet with kings. Princesses. Princesses. Okay, my bad. Yes. He had 700 princesses done, done through business and negotiations and that sort of thing. 700 wives, so that means 700 mother-in-laws. Come on, somebody. No wonder he died at a young age. Hallelujah, bless his holy name. All right, just kidding, just kidding. I love my mother-in-law. Praise his name. So then, so then, no, I do, I do, I really do. And then, uh, okay, y'all made me lose my train of thought. Okay, okay, so he started worshiping those, the, the gods of the wives that he had. Y'all remember? And, and what a covenant is, and God said, you know, why God has a covenant. A covenant is, you remember they cut the animals in half, cut the animals in half, and uh, the animals are split, and they walk in between the blood. And if, what, what the covenant says is if you break the covenant, we're going to end up split in half, just like these animals, right? Solomon begins worshiping these idol gods, and... His kingdom gets split in half. This is where you see the northern kingdom and the, and the southern kingdom of Israel. Ten tribes on the bottom, and, 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 and the prophets are so cool. The prophets came up to him and said, here, give me a rag. Whip! And ripped it and said, that's going to be your kingdom. Read it. It's, it's all in Kings, but it's real cool. And uh, so the kingdom ended up ten, ten southern tribes, and then just Judah and Benjamin. But Gen Benjamin was small, so small, they just really called it Judah, right? And so the kingdom is split. And Egypt comes in and decide, they have, there's a whole bunch of enemies that are starting to attack him, just destroying the kingdom. But God said this, he said, look, David was a man after my own heart. You're going to be able to keep uh, Judah, one tribe, you'll be able to keep that land, but all the rest is going to be taken, right? So this king of Egypt, here it is, look at 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 9. Are y'all ready for this? Tighten your seatbelt. You're going to love this. You ready? Just two verses, but watch this. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, that's the southern tribes, and southern, right, southern uh, kingdom, and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and he took everything out of the palace, right? He also carried away the gold shield. Circle that in your Bible. You know if you see gold, silver, bronze, you know it's going to be some revelation, right? Gold shields, which Solomon had made. If you read through the kings, you'll see all the gold shields that he had. It names everything that Solomon had in, the, in, in his palace, right? Then King Rehoboam. King Rehoboam is the son of Solomon. King Rehoboam is the son of Solomon, all right? He's the one in charge now. King Solomon's dead. His son is the king, right? King Re Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place to front. In other words, he realized poverty's coming. We're about to be broke down. But any of y'all have any of them old school brass beds back in the day? Come on, somebody. I ain't the only one. Come on, y'all had a, yes, 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 yes. Good days on the brass bed. Anybody have a water bed back in the day? Come on, come on. Can I get a water bed? Can I get a, a brass water bed? You know you old school. All right. <laughs> right? Didn't it look gold though? You bought it because it looked gold. Like, dang, that's kind of fly. I got the gold bed. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Until it started tarnishing. All right? <laughs> All right. But watch, watch. You know this. In, uh, it says it came. It, back up the verse 9 so y'all can see this for a second. Notice what it says. He took away all the treasures of the king's house. He took everything, but then it just lists, oh, he also carried away the gold shields. You know there's something in this, right? What does shields represent in the Bible? The shield of faith. Shields always represent faith, right? So shields uh, represent faith. What does gold represent? Deity. Deity and righteousness. So what is gold shields? Righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. Ah, so righteousness by faith gets taken from the kingdom and it gets replaced with bronze shields. Yes, faith based on judgment. I believe God, but I got to be doing right. King Shishak, almost cussed right there, excuse me. King Shishak. Guess what his name means in the Hebrew? King Shishak, his name means, and you can pull it up, but it means, can y'all put it up there? It means greedy of fine linen. Greedy of fine linen. 
Why is that significant? There it is, Greed of Fine Linen. You can pull it up on the, uh, on the website. I always have that blue letter Bible. You can always check out my Hebrew, but watch this. Greed of Fine Linen. Look at Revelation chapter 19 and 8, or just let them pull it up. Revelation 19 8. Watch what, fine, what linen represents in the Bible. Y'all know it already. This is Revelation. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. The fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So the king is greedy of fine linen because he's stealing the righteousness from the church. Yeah. Righteousness from the church, righteousness of, of faith, righteousness of faith is taken and replaced by judgment of faith. Wow. Come on, y'all. You ain't heard that at your old church. Stop tripping. Yes. Is that amazing? So watch. Why is Paul so animated? Why is he so passionate about preaching this gospel? Why are the, is the church at Corinth, the church at Corinth, some of them were committing adultery. They were, remember, chapter 6 and 7, they're sleeping with the temple prostitutes. There are temple prostitutes in Corinth. There are idols. They're coming and taking communion and getting drunk at communion. Read it us all in there. And all his rebuke is this. Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Know you not that you'll judge angels? Why are you taking your brother to court? All his rebuke is, no, you're not, no, you're not. But when the church at Galatia starts mixing law and grace, you fools, who has bewitched you? I, let's read, go back over to Galatians chapter 1. Let's see how strong he talks. Galatians chapter 1. You'll be amazed at this. And then one, bi one bit of revelation here that I got to give you. It's real quick, and it's going to be awesome. Back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 7. He said, which, the gospel that you're, is there, there's not another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Next. But even if we, or an angel from hell? hell? No, an angel from heaven. Get what he's saying right here. He says, if we, as apostles, leaders of the church, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel. Why doesn't he even say hell? Because he's trying to show you. The people that will defile this are Christians. The church. If we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that, what, than what we've preached to you, let him be accursed, anathema. Next. As we've said before, so now I say again. He's repeating himself. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than the gospel of grace that we've preached and you've received, let him be accursed. Let him be double cursed. He says it twice. Why is he so adamant about this? Why? It's because of what, exactly what's happened now. Yeah. The people of God walking around, well, I don't know if I, can, if I can get that. God, I don't have, I don't have anything to do with it. Yeah. But the reason we think small is we don't know how free this grace is, yeah. how good God is, and how righteous you are. Why? Once righteousness gets stolen, we start this judgment and conde condemnation on ourselves. I'm not worthy of that. If there's some reason in your mind, the thing you know God... In your heart, you're supposed to have. But in your mind, you're going, well, I ain't even asked for that because, uh, you know, I'm not qualified. You know, I, I did have that abortion that time. And I did, you know, I got that divorce. God probably is punishing me, you know, and I didn't pay my tithes, uh, T-I-D-E-S. And, and I didn't, and, 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 you know, so I'm probably going to be stuck in a ghetto my whole life. And, you know, I'm probably going to have to be single my whole life because I did commit fornication that time. And God's probably just going to pay me back because... If you have any of those thoughts, you're under condemnation and judgment. God doesn't bless you because you're good. He blesses you because he's good. And this is why Paul is so adamant. He's protecting the gospel. Read, keep going. Keep going. We're almost done. Come on. Oh, you with me? For, I, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? He's saying if there's any other thing that's preached, it's seeking to please men. Why? A mixed gospel. When people preach things to you like, well, God's got his part and you've got your part. He says, that pleases men. You know why? Because we feel good. Well, well, you know, brother, the reason that I have this church and this house is because I fasted 40 days. And you can see how slim I am that I've really been fasting. And you, were, you haven't been fasting because look at you. Apparently you did. And you take glory. You get what I'm saying? And, and he says, listen, for do I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Next. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. He said, if man had preached this, he would be mixing his own glory in it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This, look who it came from. Next, last verse. 
neither, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. I got this straight from Jesus. Wow. Jump on over to the book of Jude. We're closing. Book of Jude. One ver uh, a couple verses here. Book of Jude. Who is Jude? Jesus brother. Jude is Jesus' brother, along with James. Jesus has two brothers that have epistles in the Bible. Did y'all know that? Good thing you come to church. Jude and James are the half-brothers of Jesus. Both of them have epistles. Look what Jude starts out as. We're just going to read a couple verses, and I want to show you something. Watch this. Jude, a bon this is the last book next to the revelation of Jesus Christ written by John, right? John the Apostle, watch this. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Isn't that humble? He didn't call himself the brother of Jesus. Do you know that James and, and Judas were, uh, that's his name, Judas, that they initially were unbelievers. Remember when they came up to Jesus in the gospel and said, hey, your mama and your, and your brothers and sisters are out here. He said, who's my brother and my sister? That's all right. I can, you know, just him that comes to do the will of the Lord. That's who my brothers and sisters are. They weren't believers at first. They ended up being believers and they got books here. Watch this, what they say, because this is astounding. Watch what he says. He says, to those who are called, sanctified by God the, God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, Mercy, peace, and love uh, be multiplied to you. Next. Here we go. Ready? Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. He said, fight for this righteousness by faith. Fight for this, which was once for all delivered to the saints. He said, listen. This gospel has been delivered to us by the apostles, by, by Paul. He says, we're going to have to fight for this righteousness by faith. Why? Next verse. Verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. They were marked out to do what they're doing. Ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord and God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now stop right here on this verse. Watch this. What he says is here, that word turn, circle the word turn right there. Can y'all put the definition of the word turn, turn up here? Turn is the word metiphemi. I know it looks like T-H-E-M, but that's how it's pronounced. Metiphemi. Meti. What does meti mean? Change. Meti. Meti. Like, uh, what is the word repent? Metamorphosis, meta, what is the word repent? Meta, metanoia, 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 change thinking. Repent. Okay, metaphemi means to transpose. I took this directly out of Strong's Concordance. To transpose two things, one of which is put in place of the other. Some people have crept into the church and they're trying to remove grace and replace it with lewdness. So when you hear, oh, that grace, that's just letting people, greasy grace, sloppy, agape, just do what you want. He said, people, we're going to have to fight for this righteousness by faith. Watch. Let's go on. Put it back up there for me. The passage, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Make some noise from back there in the back. They work with a pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He says, he says, who turned the grace of our Lord into lewdness and deny Jesus. Watch what the law does. Doesn't the law take Jesus out and put your works in? Yes. Which is why we sing Jesus at the center of it all. The gospel always focuses on Jesus. Right. Yes. He says they're trying to take Jesus out of it and put you in it. Yes. Jump to verse 11. Watch what he says. Verse 11, last verse. Woe to them, for they have gone. He's going to list three things. And let me tell you these three, what these three things are, and then we're going home. Watch this. Go get some chicken. Ice cream. Big Macs. <laughs> Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. All right? Number one, Cain. He, he lists three things here that the church was attacked. In. The, the early church was attacked, and he describes it as they've gone the way of Cain. Do you all remember Cain? Cain was the firstborn of Adam and Eve, right? His younger brother named Abel. Abel. Cain's born. Do you remember the deal? Cain, both of them were worshiping the Lord. Both of them brought a sacrifice to the Lord. Cain brought what? Fruit, the labor of his hands. He was a farmer and brought the labor of his work. Abel was a sheep, sheep herder. He brought a sacrifice lamb. He brought a blood sacrifice of a lamb. God respected his, but didn't respect Cain's. Why? Because Cain's 
offering represented labor of my work. Cain's, uh, Abel's represented sacrifice of a lamb. He kills his brother because God respected the blood of the lamb and not the work of this man's hands. He says, here's what it is. Three things. They're going to show that the problem with this, what they've come to do is what Cain did. Present their works and not the blood of the lamb. Number two. And have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. Anybody remember Balaam? Balaam, I preached on it lots. Balaam, Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. Who is Balaam? Balaam was hired by Balak, king of Moab. Children of Israel going through their trek to, uh, through the wilderness to the promised land. They, Moab hears that, that Israel is defeating people, defeating enemies. They say, hey, the king, uh, king uh, Balak says, I got to hire this dude. So I'm going to hire this, this guy uh, to come in and curse the children of God, the, the people of Israel, right? And so he comes up and he goes up to a mountain and he pays, and the king of Moab pays him all this money in silver. He's like, cool, cool. Let me go up there and curse him. He's getting ready to go. Okay, okay, there they are. Yeah, I'll see him down there. I bless you. Balak is like, what? Dude, I paid you all that money and you keep blessing him. He comes to this conclusion and says, whatever God is blessed, I cannot curse. The, the error of Balaam is this. You're the blessed of God. If any preacher or ministry tells you you're cursed, that's the error of, error of Balaam. Watch this. Have you ever been there? I've seen it before on television. I've seen these kind of ministries, even been in these type of ministries before, where you don't do this. This is because a curse is on you. There's a, there's a generational curse on you, and your child is under this curse. You send me $1,000, I'll break the curse. Curse on you. You didn't type. You give me your money, and I'll break the curse. Come on, somebody. That's the heir of Balaam. You, uh, Ephesians 1 and 3, I think. Rephe Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who has blessed us. There it is. With every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. And I cannot be cursed. God cannot curse you. You are the blessed of God. And the heir of Balaam is somebody telling you you can be cursed as a child of God. Say, I cannot be cursed. I cannot be cursed. Balaam found it out. Second, second problem. Christians thinking they're under a curse. Third situation, put that passage back up to Jude, 1, Jude 11. There is no other chapter. Watch. Third situation, and perish in the rebellion of Korah. Korah, you remember Korah's situation? Korah, Exodus chapter, oh, no, no, uh, number 16. Numbers chapter 16, right? Numbers, and let me just tell you the story. We're closing right up there. Numbers chapter 16. Moses, right? He's the leader. Who's the, who is holding the position as high priest? Aaron's the high priest. Korah, 250 of his clones, of his, uh, of his thugs. Rise up, come on, Moses, check it out. Who put you and Aaron in charge? Who said that Aaron always gets to be the one to go up in the, in the Holy of Holies? We all holy. Who put him in charge? I, I don't remember this vote. I didn't get the vote on this. Moses is so, he's so hurt, he runs and he falls on his face and starts calling out to God. God says, get up. Tell you, get away from all the people. God says, I'm going to kill them all right now. <laughs> Moses cries out, says, please, please, God, don't kill all the people over one person. Right? God says, okay, cool. Go get Korah and all his peeps and tell everybody else to get away from all of them, all of their family, all their tents. Get away from them. I'm going to kill them all. Read it. It's all in there in Exodus chapter, I mean, in number 16. It's crazy. So then Moses calls Korah and his, and his uh, 250 thugs, and they come out, and he says, look here, here's what's going to happen. Remember what the high priest does. The high priest has the censer, incense. They get the, the coals off of the, off of the uh, labor, right? And they, and they put it in there, and they go in, and they burn the incense. The high priest, you see the high priest? He he's, has that, that censer thing, right? And it's burning, burning. And so he says, okay, tomorrow, y'all bring, there it is. Tomorrow, y'all, all 250 of y'all, you bring your censers. And Aaron's going to come along and bring his. He said, and we're going to see what's up. And then they all come. And then all of a sudden, God opens the earth. Korah, his whole family, <laughs> sucked down into the earth alive. Read it. It says, and they went down into a pit alive. All the rest of the 250 standing there in front of the temple, fire <laughs> comes busting out of the temple and literally fires them all. They, they, all get, <laughs> they all get fried and burned, all of them dead. 
All, it's all in there. Why? Why did all this happen? And again, it, then it goes on. Finally, the people are saying, well, who's the leader? We all, we all messed up. We all scared. They were terrified. They're like, who, what's going on? God said, have each, of the, have each of the captains bring their staff with them. And then they said, Aaron, whoever's bud, uh, thing buds, staff buds, that's who God's appointed, right? Okay, so what is this all about? Why did God do this? Why? Because they were saying, we don't need a high priest. We'll be the high priest ourselves. Who is the high priest? Jesus is the high priest. What you being your own high priest is like you saying, as I am, so am I in the earth. The Bible says, as he is, so am I in, the, in this earth, right? In the world. So they're saying, we don't need a high priest. We'll do it ourselves. What it is, it is doing again is taking Jesus out of the equation and lifting man up. All three of these things are showing what the church does today. In the Latter-day Church, what, what the church does is say, no, you got to do, you got to do, you got to do, and takes Jesus out of the equation. What happens is we start thinking small. We start limiting. I talk to people all the time. I go, well, why don't you just do that? Well, I don't have, I don't have. I didn't ask you what you had. What did God tell you to do? If God told you to do that and you know that's in your heart, that's not your problem. That's his problem. How, Pastor, how'd you get that church with you when you just came in town? Because I didn't, that's what God said. If God said it, it don't have nothing to do with you. Just show up. Children of Israel, just show up. God's, the giants are God's problem. They looked at the giants and said, well, we, God must be lying because they got this problem. Who cares? Listen to me. If, if you read, close your Bible. Let me just, let me just help you all understand this. Why Paul is Christian cussing at the church at Galatia is because they're allowing the law and effort to get in and take away their trust in their righteousness by faith and the grace of Christ. Think about this just for a second as we're closing. Watch this. Joseph, Joseph in the Bible, God spoke a word to him early on as a teenager. God said, your, I'm gonna, your whole family is going to be bowing down to you. Yeah. Things looked real bad after that, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. He, he held on to that. But if you read the whole count from Genesis 38 or 9, wherever it is, all through the rest of the book, you'll find after he, after he, God spoke to him in his heart, he had a dream, told his family, his family turned on him. They said, let's kill him, throw him in a pit, let's leave him for dead. One brother, which one says, no, let's sell him, let's make some money. You know which one. Judas, the Jew, come on. The Jew said, uh-uh, we can make some money off this dude. Sell him into slavery. They sell him into slavery. Now, from the pit, he goes into slavery. He's standing there with chains on him, the Bible says. But he was a prosperous man, for God was with him. As a slave, but naked. Then, while he gets into, into the, as a slave, I, I don't know about you, but the, defi, the, but the name slave just didn't, in that, you know, it don't feel good to me, right? But as a slave, he don't have a problem. He's a slave. Then while he's a slave, he's getting blessed. The Bible says he's blessed because God's with him. The wife of, of uh, what was his name? Potiphar. Potiphar says, ooh, he's cute. I like him. Let's, let me sleep with you. He takes off running. He, she accuses him of a sexual crime that he didn't commit. He ends up in prison, right? Life is looking bad. While he's in prison, two other guys come in. The butler and the baker come in, right? Butler and the baker come in, and he sees them one day, and they say, he says to them, why are y'all looking so sad? They said, we in prison. I was here when y'all got here. That means I was here before you, and I'm innocent, and I'm still smiling. How come you never see Joseph say, well, I guess God, that vision isn't true. I guess God left me. I guess this, I guess this ain't working out. And this is 14 years. Oh, no, no. Let me tell you why you don't see your dream come to pass. Why you don't see a miracle. Because when you don't see it next, next week, well, I guess that didn't work. I'm not condemning you. I'm just telling you. If Shanae had, when she'd asked God for a blessed life, God bless, give me a blessed life. Why don't you just go to, have you asked God, God, I want a blessed life where I'm debt free, where I'm able to travel and, and enjoy my family. Do you ever just... Ask him and talk to him. And then say, thank you, Jesus. Then every day, see, I know what, I, what God has for my life. And it's better than, I can't even tell y'all, y'all be mad. The only reason that people still, Christians still, the run game, cheat, lie, because they don't believe they have a God who cares. 
Just keep looking straight ahead. There are Christians that run game on unemployment, run game on, on welfare, run game, run game, cheat, lie, steal. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Why? I don't trust God. If you really trust God, you'd go, God, you got me. It might look bad. Joseph, you don't hear him saying. You can't find anywhere where he's disgruntled, complaining, whining. He's happy. Why? It don't matter how long it takes. That's what God said. We have a God that cannot lie, and he said, ask, and it will be given. What are you waiting for? Have you asked him? And then after you ask him, get up every day. Hey, thank you, Jesus. I can't wait till this home is paid for. In fact, I can't wait, Lord Jesus, and live your life like that. How about Abraham? God says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. When he was 75, Sarah 65. Couple years go by. Oh, I guess that ain't gonna work out. Uh, Sarah goes, I guess you're right. You need to hook up with Hagar. <laughs> okay. God's silent for 13 years. Y'all saw it, right? Silent for 13 years. After the boy grows up and is a, teen, a man, in, according to Hebrew, Hebrew tradition, God comes back and says, By the way, I'm gonna bless you. Still make you the father of many nations. What if he had quit? Now watch, God doesn't care how old you are. He's, God's got plenty of time. Yeah. You don't have time. <laughs> like God's got time. God, hey, hey, I got eternally. I got eternity. How long you going to wait till you say, I believe this? Yeah. Come hell or high water, I'm getting what he has for me. Yeah. We're the saints of God. I'm not going to live. Listen, you got to make a decision. Yeah. I'm not going to live a broke down life and talk about praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. You need to stand on the word of God and say, God, this is what your word says. Yeah. And every day, you ain't got to squeeze God. He's not holding out on you. Yeah. Now look, if it doesn't happen tomorrow, will you allow God to change the situation? Do you know if Joseph hadn't have been uh, turned against by his brothers, if he hadn't have been sold into slavery, if he hadn't have been, if he hadn't have been uh, accused of a sexual crime that he didn't commit, he wouldn't have been in the prison at the time when the butler and the baker had been there. If he hadn't have been there at the time the butler and baker, had, baker were there, he couldn't have been able to interpret the dream for the king, for Pharaoh. If he hadn't have interpreted the dream, it all changed in seemingly one day. Because he didn't quit. Well, what if he said, no, nah, I can't. I don't know nothing about no dreams. It bumped this. You know, yeah, you know, I'm just here doing my time. I got these tattoos. You know, you see what I'm saying? Look, what's up? And walk around with a stupid look on his face being hard and mean. You ought to walk with expectation of God's absolute best. You're a child of the most high God. God loves you more than you love you. God has more in store for you than you could possibly imagine. Get rid of your small ambitions. Get rid of those small dreams. Push God and say, God, I want it all. I'll take it all, Jesus. Thank you so much. He paid too great of a price on the cross for your health, for your wealth, for you to walk around on the earth being broke down, busted, and disgusted, talking about hallelujah. That's not who we are. We're the people of God. Stand up on your feet. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We magnify you. And we thank you, God, that we are the people of God. You said ask. We didn't say, you said ask. It shall be given to us. Seek and we shall find. Knock and it will be open. For whoever asks receives. We are not so special to be outside of your promise. Who do you think you are being so special that God's promise doesn't fit you though? No, this is what the devil will tell you. But that works for Pastor Leonard, but it doesn't work for you. Does God like me and Shanae better than you? No. 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 I'll tell you my stink. I can tell you. No, we're all the same. We're all the people of God, perfect in his eyes. Come on, y'all. Just pray for a second. Father, we thank you. No more small thinking. No more. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We will not hang our head low. And the... This righteousness by faith, we've got to hear it. 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 You've got to hear it on a consistent basis. That's the only way you'll believe for the impossible. It's the only way. So, Lord, I thank you for all your lambs and your sheep. I declare we are the blessed of the Lord. We are the healed. We're the redeemed from the curse of the law. And everything that you paid for, we won't let one bit of any promise that you paid for on the cross go unclaimed. We are the Benjamin generation. Five times as much because of the favor and grace of God. 
favor surrounds you like a shield. Psalms 5.12. Proverbs says that favor rests on your head. On the head of the righteous is favor. We have blessing and favor and abundance. We thank you for it, Father.